that, that would be. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. I know some people will still be arriving, but I, I wanted to welcome everyone to the first COVID-19 Community Leadership Summit um, held by the uh, Center for Behavioral and Addiction Medicine and our community sponsors. There's a number of us who are sponsoring this, and you can see from the from the um, from the, the slide here who is involved. It's it's really a wonderful. Um, uh, opportunity from many of the part partners in the in the community to get together to talk about uh, vaccine equity, particularly around COVID-19, and to begin thinking about ways of highlighting best practices um, and how to move this forward to bring um, health equity into our communities writ more broadly. Um, I'm Steve Shopta. I'm the director at the Center for Behavioral and Addiction Medicine. It's my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce to you today. Dr. Delara Uskoop. Dr. Uskoop is a uh, double PhD um, person from the a scholar from the uh, uh, University of Chicago, both uh, with a doctorate both in divinity and in political science. She's been working with our center for the past year and a half or so, building up her skills in public health as well as these other wonderful areas of divinity and in terms of uh, uh, political science and is a triple threat. And, and we're, we're so happy to have her here in Los Angeles. Already she's made so many wonderful connections among people in our communities. And uh, without further ado, Delara, you're in charge of today. I know we're in great hands. I look forward to learning. Thank you, Dr. Shapta, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We are really delighted to have you all here with us. I wanna thank everyone who has been a part of the planning process thank the panelists who are presenting. And then again, most of all, we wanna thank you, the audience. And can we go to the next slide? So again, as Dr. Shaptal has introduced our group, we're from the Center for Behavioral and Addiction Medicine. And I just wanted to highlight all of the scholars and researchers that are part of our particular initiative. Next slide. And the Center for Behavioral Addiction Medicine is a multidisciplinary center that seeks to advance, and pre advance the prevention and treatment of chronic illnesses, conducts clinical trials and behavioral studies, and focus, the, focus is, is, the focus is on communities with health disparities. And we're, I, I'm excited, uh, Dr. Shapta actually, he led one of the efforts to do conduct a uh, COVID-19 Moderna vaccine clinical trial site at the Vine Street Clinic. And so, and I think one of the other researchers that was involved, uh, principal investigators of, of that project, Dr. Jesse Clark, will be joining us a little bit later. And so we're really excited to um, add on to this work that we have been doing as a part of the center around COVID, COVID-19 vaccination, and then now thinking about COVID-19 uptake, vaccination uptake. Next slide. Our broader project today is supported by the California Community Foundation and our aims of this project are threefold and that is to facilitate, educate and navigate. And what we want to do is facilitate public, private and community and governmental partnerships to reduce COVID-19 vaccine inequity, educate communities of South, uh, communities of color in South Los Angeles about the COVID-19 vaccine, vaccines through these virtual town halls and summits, and also to navigate communities of color in South Los Angeles on how to access COVID-19 vaccines. Next slide, please. And yes, and if you want to get in touch with our research team, we have our contact information included in the slide below, and we will move to our next slide. So again, this, this afternoon, we're doing something a little bit different. We're doing this virtual town hall, virtual forum, community summit, and the format is going to be a little bit different. So we're going to do a, a version of speed dating. And I know we're going to go through this very quickly and I'm going to ask our panelists to really stick to that three to five minutes. But the goal here was to um, really just to uh, provide the audience with an opportunity to learn about efforts that are going on um, within the Department of Public Health and to speak with public, hear from public servants, to hear from academic researchers, to hear from faith leaders, to hear from community-based organizations um, about the different resources that are available 
as far as COVID-19 vaccination here in South Los Angeles. So we have a slate of 10 speakers, each of which will present a, a number of slides to talk about the effort that they're involved in and how you can get involved and how you can get in touch, um, get in touch with their organization and or uh, collaborate with them. So again, the format is gonna be pretty rapid pace and so we are asking that everyone kind of stick to as, as far as our panelists are concerned that they stick to stick to that format of our three to five minutes and at the end we will have an opportunity to do a question and answers um you know and we're asking because it's so rapid fire and because we'll be moving from person to person pretty quickly we are asking that attendees go ahead and put their questions in the chat as we move along in this process um, so that you you know you don't forget that question and we will come back at the end and address address those questions at the at the at the end so again we want to discuss and share resources to equip community members and leaders on how to mobilize and increase vaccine access and uptake in communities in South Los Angeles. There is a survey that we asked everyone to take uh, that you may have seen as you were doing registration. And if you haven't taken that survey, we're asking that you please take it. We'll drop that survey in the chat. Um, this is really important. So the goal here is to really be able to collect and aggregate all the community-based organizations in South Los Angeles and in the greater Los Angeles area to really figure out who's doing what and where. And we, we want to be able to use this as a database to, um, to support vaccine, uh, not only vaccination efforts, but also COVID-19 recovery efforts. So this is, this, is, uh, this is really critical, really vital. We're asking that you just complete that survey for us. And I believe it has been dropped into, um, into, into the chat. And again, we want to better understand the needs and capacity of our partners that are on this call today. So we are asking for that. And again, I may be interrupting from time to time to keep things moving. So again, I just wanna just ask, ask that everyone be patient with us. And if there is nothing else, oh, and I also wanna plug in finally uh, that after this series of town halls, this is one town hall of three more town halls that we will be doing, one with providers and two with community members and essential workers, one in English and one in Spanish. And one of the research aims that we have as part of this is to, one of the research activities rather is to do a series of focus groups. So you may be hearing a little bit about um, focus groups in our continued conversation and communication with you all. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our very first speaker, Dr. Tracy Veal. And I will just ask that as the as we move forward in this conversation for our presenters, as as each person to, so that we can just keep the ebb and flow of the conversation just moving and we're not having to stop. I'm going to ask each presenter to introduce themselves as they see uh, their slide. And, and I know the presenters do know, um, you know, the order in which they will be presenting. So I'll just ask you to just jump in and introduce yourself. Thank you so much. And without again further ado, Dr. Veal. Hi, I'm Dr. Tracy Wheel, and I'm with the Los Angeles Department of Public Health, and I'm responsible for COVID vaccine collaboration. And if you go to the next slide, basically, uh, because of COVID, we, we are really focused on collaborations with all types of entities. If you go to the next slide, I wanted to give you a brief overview of some of the work that we have been doing with various uh, entities. So if you look at December, we started out with stakeholders uh, engagement and we created an equity committee of, of a convening of physicians and community organizations, faith-based organization. When the vaccine came in January, we moved forward with uh, some alarming uh, abrupt changes because of the inequity that was inherent, not just in the vaccine, but a lot of co-opting of sites that were in uh, lower income and vulnerable communities. So a lot of advocacy, advocacy went forth and we were able to um, shift the vaccine to redirect it to some of the communities that really were hard hit by COVID. And now as we look towards the next, uh, in spring, March and April, advocacy continued and at the state level, 40% of vaccine uh, was redistributed, redirected to the equity targeted zip codes. And we're moving forward with philanthropic funding, something called grassroots grants to help support community organizations, faith-based organizations, uh, help get the vaccine distributed and to the target communities that are really, uh, were really disproportionately impacted. So we're doing everything from vaccine mobile clinics with different constituent groups to education and outreach at places from laundromats to mom and pop stores. 
And if you look in May, um, this just shows you at uh, the beginning of May where we stood in terms of vaccine equity across the different uh, racial and ethnic groups. We still have a ways to go, but what I remember in March uh, and at the peak of the, the epidemic was that uh, we had zero uh, in some of these zip codes and now we're moving forward in about 30% or more in some of the brown and black communities, but we still have a ways to go. And that's it for me. I'll go to the next person. Thank you. Uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon. My name is Robert Contreras. I'm the, the president and CEO for Bienestar. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, Bienestar is a community-based healthcare and social service organization in the greater Los Angeles area. Our expertise is identifying and addressing emerging health issues faced by the Latino and LGBTQ populations. Our programs include HIV treatment and prevention, sexual health, mental health services, substance use counseling, and medication-assisted treatment. Next slide, please. Uh, Bienestar is a bridge between the Latinx community and, and COVID-19 vaccine providers. Our aims of this program is to provide, uh, to create partnerships, do outreach, educate, invite, and vaccinate. Uh, for this um, project, we have engaged partnership with Wesley's, Wesley Health, St. John's uh, Health, and AHF. Uh, we have partnered uh, with these FQHCs to increase the access to vaccines in the Latinx community by securing a specific dates dedicated to our clients and mobile vaccination clinics, our centers. Uh, these events have been very successful. In the last three months, uh, we have helped vaccinate over 750 individuals. In terms of outreach, we have used uh, social media, internet, phone service, flyers and door-to-door -door outreach. Uh, we have taken advantage of our 30 year uh, of being in the community and the trust we have built. Uh, they has uh, afforded us to be able to provide a message that's well received and without bias. In terms of education, we, we are going into the community and explaining the benefits of getting vaccinated, dispelling misinformation and meet the uh, the client where they are at. Again, um, in order to educate, we have taken advantage of the trust we have built and our message resonates with the community um, because it's coming from peers that look like them and live in the same communities they live in. Uh, once we have educated them, we invite them and raise them to get uh, vaccinated at one of the mobile vaccine uh, clinics at, Venus, at the Bienestar centers. Uh, and then we also follow up a day before their appointment to remind them that their appointment is the next day. The day of the vaccination, we greet them, we check them in, we provide uh, food to the individuals that usually consists of coffee and sweet bread. We vaccinate them, we remind them about the second dose if a uh, second dose is needed. And a few weeks later, we call them back again in order for them to come back uh, for the second dose. The second phase of this project is almost it's almost the same as phase one with small tweaks to it. Uh, it's a combination of all vaccination clinic at our centers and vaccinations out in the community. For this partnership, we have engaged St. John's Health and AHF, and we are planning to conduct vaccination clinic at different venues, um, starting with our mobile syringe exchange sites. Uh, the outreach is almost the same, except that we are doing more door to door uh, outreach at supermarkets, laundromats, and other places where Latinx congregates. The education piece, <clears throat> excuse me, the education piece um, is about the same. Um, we we promote the vaccine, uh, the benefit of the vaccination. We dismiss uh, misinformation, and we meet them where they are. This way, we then recruit them and bring them back to the mobile vaccination unit to administer the vaccine. Uh, after the vaccination, we engage the individual and ask them to become a champion for the vaccine and to start and to help us spread uh, the word of mouth. Uh, research has shown that word of mouth by trusted individuals is a very effective method for recruiting. 
So we are going to try to, uh, to recruit everyone to be a champion so we can curb this pandemic. Um, next slide. If you have any questions about uh, the project, uh, you can contact us at all these um, uh, emails for any questions. Thank you. Hi, um, Pim Manja, President and CEO of St. John's Well Child and Family Center. Um, we can move to the next slide. So <clears throat> St. John's was um, committed from the beginning of the pandemic um, to impacting on the communities that were most affected by it. Um, South LA, East LA had the highest um, death rates, the highest infection rates. Many essential workers who lived there were unable uh, to shelter at home. And we saw just huge amounts of suffering um, and, and lack of access to even testing resources. Next slide. So St. John's is a, a nonprofit federally qualified health center. We have um, 20 sites and we provide services to about 450,000 patient visits every year, 100,000 unduplicated patients. Um, we began testing back in March. Uh, the Trump administration decided to send the test swabs to the private laboratories, uh, which were then distributing them to the, to the locations with the highest insurance payouts. And so there were little, literally no test kits in South LA, uh, but we contracted with um, a local lab. We were able to get testing started. We tested over hundred thousand people, about 35% came back positive. Uh, through telehealth and other services, we were able to triage them and prevent um, their disease from progressing. If it did, uh, we were in touch with them every other day, we would get them into a hospital. Uh, we were the first federally qualified health center in the country uh, to provide monoclonal antibody infusion therapy. Um, and we've created a COVID monitoring follow-up uh, clinic to reduce long-term impacts uh, of COVID for the tens of thousands of folks we tested and our patients who had COVID. <clears throat> we began a massive vaccination effort in actually late December. Um, and we began engaging. We had hundreds of organizations sign on to a letter to the state and the county departments of public health demanding that vaccine be provided into low income communities like South LA and East LA. To date, we have vaccinated over 250,000 uh, low income individuals um, next slide. <clears throat> so as you can see, 54% um, of the folks we vaccinated are Latino, 28% African-American, 12% Asian, and 6% white. Uh, we've administered 266,747 COVID vaccines at 26 vaccination sites um, and four mobiles. So we have four mobiles, that have partnered with churches, community-based organizations, elected officials. Um, we have vaccination within our clinic sites. We have after hours vaccine clinics, early morning vaccine clinics, community vaccine sites at the East LA Civic Center, at Compton College, Clinton Elementary. And then we have partnerships with school districts which have created uh, vaccine sites at um, high schools throughout South LA. Um, and those circles in the grant shows you the penetration, the vaccine penetration uh, that we, we did in South Los Angeles and up to the right in East Los Angeles. Um, so that's my presentation. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, this is Robin Kistler. I'm a consultant with Kaiser Family Foundation and I'm really thrilled to be with you here today. Thank you very much for um, the invitation. Thanks to Dr. Uskoop for organizing and to Damilola for all of the behind the scenes logistics that got all of our, our speakers ready. Um, if we could go to the next slide. I am delighted to be sharing with you some resources from a public information campaign KFF has created in partnership with a whole bunch of healthcare workers and others to dispel myths and provide facts about COVID-19 vaccines. It's called Conversation or in Spanish, La Conversacion. Next slide, please. 
We are the other Kaiser. You are probably thinking of Kaiser Permanente. We are not that Kaiser. <laughs> We're the Kaiser Family Foundation focused on health issues in the United States um, with policy analysis, polling and survey research, journalism and social impact media. I'm in the last part of that social impact media, but you might also just note our COVID vaccine monitor that provides uh, representative sample polls every few weeks of Americans' attitudes and uptake of, those, of the vaccine. So all of that is available at kff.org um, and includes race, ethnicity split. So you can see how we're doing in terms of health equity. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the name of our campaign is The Conversation. It is really designed to answer questions uh, the black and brown communities in particular, which are the same questions that everybody else has, uh, but they are, the messaging is created by, for, with, um, and distributed out to um, particularly black and Latinx people. Uh, you can find a lot of information about it with the hashtag between us about us. And the next slide, just to give a little background, um, we have 24 healthcare workers. They are physicians, nurses, researchers, promotoras, uh, community health workers who are actively providing vaccines and vaccine information to their patients. They come from a variety of backgrounds, a number of pediatricians, uh, emergency medicine folks, um, nurse practitioners, a, a broad range of specialties and have created a series that answers questions directly related to each of those. Next slide, please. Our initiative grows out of a campaign we've been running for about 12 years called Greater Than AIDS. So it runs under KFF's Greater Than COVID um, initiative, which started over a year ago. And if you'd click one more time, we launched our first campaign in March, um, on March 4th actually, with W. Kamau Bell and these 14 black uh, healthcare workers who created about 50 videos answering questions for black communities. So that one's been out for whatever the math is, two and a half months. Um, and just yesterday, if we can click once more, um, we expanded this series with another 80 videos featuring the Latinx healthcare workers. So what you can see here now is what you find when you go to our website, betweenusaboutus.org, which are the initial series for the black community, another series in English for the Latinx community and also in, for Spanish speakers. So you can navigate and find all of them together, or you can go particularly depending which communities that you're working with. Um, I think the main message I would love for you all to take away is that all of this content is available to you for free to use in your communities in any ways that you can think of. So if you have an idea of, could I do this with the video? The answer is yes. And it's all uh, rights free for public education use. If you give me another click, um, we can look at some examples of what the videos are. So this is just three. I mentioned there's over 130 on our website, also on our YouTube channel. Um, so they're easy to integrate. But just to give you an idea of some of the top questions that we're responding to, we know that young people are less likely to feel a need to get vaccinated. And so this, this video answers that question directly. Um, why, you know, first of all, it's you're not necessarily safe. And secondly, you may inadvertently transmit to someone else. Next slide, please. Um, we know from our surveys that we have missed basic information that the vaccines are free and many people don't know that. So this talks about they're free. So that is a prime message. We go from sort of the basics into more specifics on fertility, et cetera. Next slide, please. And where can I get vaccinated? Folks don't know where to go when they're ready. So um, fundamentals and then going into details. So just to quickly run through, and if you can just quick run through each of these slides, I'll just say two words. You can embed them on your website. This is a website that Virginia maintains for its COVID vaccine ambassadors. If you're training outreach workers, please use the videos to help with that effort. Next slide. This is an example of embedding. This is California's Vaccinate All 58 campaign. Some of these videos are theirs, some are ours. They just pull them from YouTube and it's all integrated. So they've expanded their content for no cost. Next slide. You can put it out in a newsletter or share on your social media. Next slide. Uh, we've had churches stream the content into their um, virtual services. Next slide. Radio shows, you can play the content, have a discussion about it. Dr. Rhea Boyd down in the center has been one of our physician advisors. Next slide. 
and easiest thing to do free we all have access to is share on social media and the whole campaign has been designed for that so i think that's all i have i think let me just quick one more slide make sure i didn't forget something ah these are from yesterday a few of the new latinx series um with the new dose us and the florida health justice project um, that's all I have. I am thrilled to say California Community Foundation is partnering to help get these out, particularly in Los Angeles, and we'll be focusing on black and brown zip codes over the next month with these video messages. So I hope you will see them on your phones and share them with your friends. Thank you. And my microphone. Good afternoon, fam. I am uh, the Reverend Kamal Hassan, uh, pastor of Sojourner Truth Presbyterian Church in the San Francisco Bay Area, the city of Richmond. And I want to shout out my folks. Um, I am Los Angeles born and grown and lived in South LA all my life until I moved to the Bay in 1999, where I have resided and worked since then. Next slide, please. I am a part of the COVID-19 Prevention Network. Next slide. There's my picture. I am a faith ambassador with the COVID-19 Prevention Network. The network was uh, initiated through the National Institute of Health. And it's a, of course, nationwide program in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm specifically a part of something that's called the um, Faith uh, Initiative, and I'm a faith ambassador for the Western region. I work with a group of folks who are faith consultants, who are um, trusted voices in uh, African American faith communities. And through our work together, we reach out to faith communities because pastors and faith leaders are trusted voices in both the African-American, the um, Latinx and the First Nations community, because of course those, were, those are the three groups that are most disproportionately affected by COVID-19 as far as infection, sickness and death. Let's go on to the next one two of our faith uh, consultants who serve in the Bay. And the next slide, please. Uh, Reverend Dr. Clyde Oden, who served as pastor in Los Angeles for quite a long time, who was also working with us in the, in the Bay Area. Now let's go to the next one. So these are uh, four of our sponsoring agencies and you can see that many of them uh, agencies that are also fighting the AIDS uh, HIV pandemic and because of the similarities in effect and need, uh, they support the work that we are doing as well. Let's continue. We are in 72 uh, different locations in the United States and we are of course serving in the Western region here in the state of California. Next slide. These are some of the national uh, faith consultant individuals. We have faith in, uh, ambassadors and clergy consultants that work specifically in believing communities. Let's go on to the next one. Faith and health, what are we talking about here? As you can see, this scripture talks about um, Jesus asking the question, do you want to be well? Unfortunately, we live in a culture where black, brown, and indigenous lives are treated as if they are disposable and replaceable. My theology emphasizes an understanding that black lives, brown lives, and indigenous lives are not disposable or replaceable, and that all of us matter. We believe that our lives are sacred. And because of this, we are born and live in the image of God. And one of the things that Jesus said in the gospel according to John is that I came that they might have life and have life more abundantly. And so the question for us is in a, in a COVID pandemic, 
What does abundant life mean? It means vaccination. It means masking. It means participating in clinical trials. And it means engaging in conversations in your faith community with your faith leaders about the value of your lives and how we might protect and extend those lives at a time such as this. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. So Jesus asks us to get up, pick up your mat and walk through clinical participation, participation in clinical trials, through vaccination, through observing safety protocols such as masking and distancing so that we might show we value one another's lives and protect each other from both accidental um, infection that could lead to losing the lives of folks that cannot be replaced. If you want to get more information about the COVID VPN, you can contact me through my email address, teachelder at gmail.com. The COVID VPN has uh, a website and a YouTube channel with tremendous amounts of helpful content. That's co capital C with a small O and capital V P N. And if you just Google that, you can find our YouTube channel and our website. Thank you. Blessings. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hassan, for that presentation. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan. Thank you, Reverend Hassan, for that presentation. It's a, a difficult presentation to follow behind, but I will do my best. Um, so my name is Christopher Blaze. I'm the Community Program Manager with UCLA Center for Behavioral and Addiction Medicine, I'm also with UCLA Vine Street Clinic. And I'm going to spend the next few minutes discussing our contributions to um, a vaccine study that was done here in Los Angeles County. Uh, next slide, please. And the next one. Okay, thank you. So the UCLA Vine Street Clinic was established in 2005 in an effort to address the spread of HIV among meth using populations in Los Angeles County. Um, it's since evolved into a multidisciplinary site for clinical trials, uh, behavioral research, and uh, direct services uh, targeting uh, treatment for people that are using substances as well as HIV prevention. Our site is affiliated with multiple networks that are funded by the National Institute of Health, such as the HIV Prevention Trials Network, the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, the Clinical Trials Network, and then more recently, the Coronavirus Prevention Network that Reverend Hassan was speaking about earlier. Because of our um, standing partnerships with these networks, we were selected as a clinical research site to conduct some Moderna vaccine study. Um, next slide, please. So the Moderna vaccine study was a phase three clinical trial looking to evaluate the effectiveness of an mRNA vaccine against COVID-19. Uh, sites that were affiliated with that study started to enroll participants in the middle of July of 2020. It took our site a few weeks to get up and running. We enrolled our first trial participant in the beginning of August of 2020. We did notice, however, within that delay that sites that were enrolling participants, the participants did not reflect communities that were being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And so we really wanted to address that. So our focus really was to educate, engage, and recruit communities of color that were being hit um, hardest by this pandemic. And so in order for us to achieve that, we knew we needed to be strategic in our recruitment efforts. So we launched a social media campaign that ran for about five weeks. And the ads were targeted um, based on areas and zip codes that had high incidence of COVID-19. We also worked with a lot of our community partners. We went to local businesses um, that were open during the shutdown and really had um, 
kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations with the frontline staff that we thought would uh, best benefit from a study like this. We orchestrated uh, several interviews with media outlets, um, utilizing study staff and enrolled participants to really speak openly and honestly about their experience with COVID-19, their experience with this particular research. And then if there was any hesitancies initially, ultimately what shift, what shifted their decision to, to join the study. That was really helpful for us. We also utilized um, registries that we had access to, so COVID registries, one being UCLA Health Registry, CVS Health Registry, and then the COVPN Registry. And we were able to kind of funnel through hundreds and hundreds of profiles of people that inquired about COVID vaccines, looking for people that fell within those particular areas and zip codes, and that also met criteria um, that would make them more susceptible to COVID-19 infection. And then we relied a lot on word of mouth. So having in-depth conversations with people that were already enrolled into the study um, and providing them with some straightforward um, talking points that they could then take back to their social networks, whether it be friends or family members, and then have them uh, direct those contacts to us and then screen them for the study. So that was successful. Um, last slide, please. And so I wanna end with this. Um, I think this is a really highlight for us um, because we knew that it would be um, somewhat challenging um, having interactions with people that had no experience with, with clinical research, um, especially when you're talking about vaccines. And so our site enrolled a little over 200 participants in a seven week period. And of the 200 people that enrolled, 73% of them identified as a person of color. Um, and I think that was very important because oftentimes communities of color are underrepresented in clinical research. And my last slide. Um, so if you want to get in contact with me or if you uh, would like for me to join any initiative, my contact information is there. And thank you for the opportunity today. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Brenda Cruz and I'm here with Michelle Tabahanda. We are equity, diversity and inclusion fellows at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Next slide. Uh, today we are here with the COVID-19 vaccine volunteer crew. Next slide. So in partnership with the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health and community partners, we are funded by the UCLA Health Innovation Health Equity Grant, and we provide clinical data and logistical volunteer support to FQHC vaccine clinics. Next slide. We have placed over 200 ongoing volunteers throughout South Los Angeles, including Eisner Health, St. John's Well Child Center, and the Central Neighborhood Health Foundation. Here listed are some of the other clinics we have placed volunteers in. And we generally ask and receive volunteers who are available for at least one shift a week for six weeks. And clinics have different needs. So next slide, please. Um, clinics have different needs and students and community members want to contribute and can help meet staffing needs. If you wanna have an event, volunteers can help with some of these duties, including clinical work like administering the vaccine and non-clinical work. I have personally volunteered at these clinics and have helped with registration and form assistance. And when I'm out volunteering, I see people like my dad, a Spanish speaker who gets nervous when visiting the doctor. But when I offer my assistance to other Spanish speakers or people who need help understanding the difficult forms that they have to fill out, I see a sigh of relief in their face when they, don't, they know that they don't have to go through that alone or confused. Um, and additionally, we offer support with data entry, logistical support, help with monitoring cold chain and post-vaccine observation. Next slide. So how do we recruit volunteers? Uh, based on each clinic's needs, we may reach out to schools and student organizations within the area. Listed here are some of the universities that we've worked with. 
Uh, we will do email blasts through department listservs, and we will also be starting a social media outreach campaign to reach student volunteers that way. Um, depending on the request, we can do more targeted recruitment. For example, a clinic being held in Palmdale, we reached out to the Palmdale Chamber of Commerce for volunteer outreach. Next slide, please. This is just some information to consider when making a request for volunteers. I will let you all read through all this. But um, for an example of an existing volunteer signup, Venice Family Clinic has their own website for volunteer signups. So we've been able to help them by sending out that link widely. I myself have been able to go out and volunteer with clinics through different methods. For example, I have been able to do vaccine outreach for unsheltered communities experiencing homelessness through Housing for Health with the county. And we have always benefited with having additional volunteers because we can cover larger ground and talk to more people. And it has really made a difference uh, having people from all backgrounds being willing and able to have conversations with people and answer answer any questions they may have um, about the vaccine. And then here at the end, I just wanna mention um, what type of on-site supervision is available for clinical trainee volunteers. So for example, trainees have to be supervised by a licensed RN or clinician. So it can be from your own staff or that can be another volunteer that we can provide. The more information that you're able to provide, the faster we can get volunteers at your clinics. Next slide, please. So here's our contact information, including our project lead, Dr. Chelsea Schover from the UCLA School of Medicine. Um, if you're interested in getting volunteers, please reach out to us and we can do an initial call or site visit to work out the logistical details. And at the bottom here, we have also included our volunteer sign up if you or anyone you know is interested in volunteering yourselves. Next slide, please. Finally, here is a compilation of just some of the wonderful volunteers who have been able to come out with us. Thank you for allowing us to share our initiative. Hello, I uh, hope everyone's having a great day. It's uh, truly an honor to, to uh, be here with you and it's a lot of great information so far. And uh, I see a lot of people on this panel as well that I'll be reaching out to myself. So. Uh, I'm Desi Brown Jr. and I'm the Director of Marketing and Logistics for Pull Up Neighbor, uh, a nonprofit organization that's based in LA. Uh, I'm actually based in Dallas, but we do a lot of uh, work across the nation. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, more about Pull Up Neighbor. Uh, our mission is simple. We're a black owned community response team focused on the health and well-being of minorities and vulnerable communities. Our goal is to provide immediate and direct assistance to communities in need across the country. Uh, we were started during the pandemic and, you know, we noticed that there was a need with people needing food, people needing COVID resources, whether it being hand sanitizer, mask or anything like that. And so that's how we were started. And um, the pull up neighbor impact uh, over eight months, we have visited uh, over 51 cities, uh, provided, you know, underserved communities. Uh, we gave over uh, 100,000 food boxes and fresh produce boxes, uh, over 100,000 individual meals, over 500,000 pounds of fresh fruit uh, and produce, uh, over 200,000 uh, hand sanitizers and 200,000 face masks, over 75,000 COVID-19 essential kits and over 50,000 personal hygiene kits. And uh, we also uh, in the past have partnered with Black Men Vote and uh, we got 10,000 people registered to vote. We led about 100,000 people to the polls and uh, we also provided 5,000 rides to the polls. Next slide, please. And uh, when it comes to the COVID-19 uh, vaccine services and resources, uh, we partnered with Black Men Vote, uh, who now goes by Black Men Vax, in order to provide information about the vaccine and how and where to get the vaccine in Black and Brown communities across the nation. Uh, in LA, we actually partnered with Kedron Health and the mayor's office to drive people to their location in South Central. And on April 10th, we had about 1,000 people that came out to get vaccinated. Uh, next up, we're going to be doing a, a similar program in DC, 
Uh, we're also speaking uh, to people in Miami and Atlanta as well about doing the same type of uh, programs there. And, uh, and we typically use uh, methods such as getting people out and getting people excited about the event by providing a DJ, music, food trucks, you know, just making it an exciting environment. And we also want to make it easy as possible. You want to meet people where they are, because if people don't have transportation, then, um, you know, in the past, we partnered with Uber or Lyft to get them rides or uh, transportation companies to provide busing and things like that. And another option is mobile vaccination units. And um, we just like to say that it's similar to voting. You can't make people vote or tell them who to vote for, but you can provide them with all the information that they need in order to make an informed decision. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, if you need to reach out to myself or the founder of Pull Up Neighbor, uh, here's my information there. Uh, you can also follow us on uh, Instagram at pullupneighbor.com. Thank you. Hi, I am. Thank you so much for that. Um, I immediately wish that I had known about your resource about three weeks ago, so we'll, we'll be calling you. Um, so thank you so much for allowing me to be in this space uh, with all of you. And um, like all great moments, I'm gonna start with a story about Home Depot, um, which is I was driving by the Home Depot. I live in Lincoln Heights actually on the same block as St. John's uh, Clinic there at Lincoln High School. Um, and I was driving by the, uh, the Home Depot near my house with my daughter and I saw someone putting up get out the shop flyers. And I had to pull over, I thought, oh, this is one of the 600 volunteers that I work with that I've trained in our complete care model. So I got out and I thought, oh, Home Depot is a great place to canvas. So I got out and I started talking to him and realized that he was a person in the community who had just used the resources that I had put out publicly and was on his own canvassing, doing outreach and had booked 200 appointments for uh, his neighbors in his apartment building in Lincoln Heights. So. Um, that story to me is the thing we wanted to offer to Los Angeles in this moment started to work. Um, and that was really exciting. So again, every good story has to involve Home Depot in some part. So next slide, please. So Get Out the Shot started uh, solely as a volunteer collective that was aimed to uh, get eligible folks vaccine appointments. Um, we recognized that there were so many barriers to accessing vaccine and that just being eligible didn't mean you actually had access. So we created a request line. Uh, we created a transcription program and a bank of transcription and outreach volunteers who would call folks back and get their information and figure out exactly what they needed to make an appointment. We then, especially when we were working with folks who had multiple barriers or um, some other type of vulnerability, uh, we would escort either in person or on the phone all the way through an appointment. Part of our complete care model of making appointments for folks is knowing where to send them and knowing the community health organizations, St. John's, thank you, um, that were taking such excellent care and such respectful, dignified uh, care of the folks that we were trying to help. So our space was just the appointment space and we made tens of thousands of appointments. I myself have made 2,500 and I'm maybe like not even a B plus one of my own volunteers. Um, and what we were seeing, one of the tools that we use and that I uh, train folks on is um, using sort of a barriers assessment to figure out what it was that someone needed. And right when everyone saw um, appointments opening up and supply increasing, we started to see that the folks who were left that still needed our help had too many barriers for us to solve. So our pivot into the live space has been to be part of a pilot program that is bringing mobile vaccination clinics um, directly to public housing complexes. Um, so that is the work that Get Out the Shot is doing now. We still run our appointment line. We still continue um, to train volunteers to be able to do that work, but we've also pivoted to being in person and are looking to um, and are looking to expand that. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So this is just um, an example. We have uh, flyers uh, in 
I think we have 15 languages now. I pulled over and took a picture of a flyer up in a neighborhood that I don't live in that someone else put up because um, I was seeing them all over. Um, and I started this outreach work because of where I live in Lincoln Heights and recognizing um, that my neighbors were going to have difficulty accessing the, especially the early iterations of the appointment system. And my my day job uh, is working in childcare and child development. So I knew that the Department of Health was such a trusted partner for me for being open during COVID, um, but also that it could have been tricky to, um, that it could have been tricky to navigate for someone with barriers around internet access or even just that basic knowledge um, of, of what was available to them. So we partnered with folks one-on-one -on -one and really firmly decided that our role in the uptake space and the hesitancy space was just to provide access that was so relational, so careful, and so complete that those folks could then go back to their own communities where they are the experts, they are the advice giver, and share back it was okay, I was taken care of, I was treated well. So one of the other neat things about Get Out The Shot is that the average number of referrals that we would get from each person we booked um, through our appointment system is we would get 50 personal referrals uh, from, uh, from that person. So we felt like that model of complete care could translate from the virtual space where we were just on the phone with people and texting to the in-person space. Can I have the next slide, please? So these are some of our um, some photos from some of our mobile um, vaccination events. These are some of our volunteer vaccinators. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, this is my favorite picture from uh, this is from when we were at Nickerson Gardens. And what you can't see in this picture is there is a ring of and I was I was part of the ring <laughs> um, around this young woman who had a lot of fear and worry about getting the vaccine. She gave us permission to share the photo, obviously. Um, and it wasn't really needle fear. It was just a general really strong concern. And so she had friends, family members and us as part of this ring around her. And when someone looks at that photo and thinks, well, that was a lot of people just, just to get one person vaccinated, I think, yep, that's exactly what we're doing right now because none of us have found surprises in our data. None of us have ha found um, <clears throat> inconsistencies with you know, the folks who are still being underserved with, um, you know, with access to vaccines and the communities that were hardest hit by COVID. May I have the next slide, please? This is one of our, um, you know, volunteer registrants at one of our clinics. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, this is a high school student who is my absolute top-notch canvasser. I can send him anywhere and he will talk to anyone. And he brings people to our mobile sites like the Pied Piper. And I hope he has a long and distinguished career in public service, hopefully public health. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, you know, a lot of the narratives that we hear from people at these mobile sites is I would not have gotten this vaccine if you weren't, um, if you weren't here. So the way that we've been very, very lucky is that our volunteer body, even in the appointment times, was made up of so many folks who converted from someone we helped get an appointment to someone who joined our effort to help. So we have lightning rods within these communities of folks who live there, serve there, work there, and are, um, you know, are able to have that deep impact in identifying sites uh, that need our, um, you know, that need this assistance right now. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so this handsome guy here. Uh, his um, his mom gave me permission to, to share a little bit of his story as well. We had, this was last Sunday, we had already packed everything up and we were ready to go. And she came and she told one of the vaccinators that she was worried um, her son has Down syndrome and she was worried that getting the vaccine could increase some of the challenges that he has. So we all got out, unpacked, undid, you know, sat there and, um, when he and he was excited to get his vaccine and so when she felt like it was a good idea we were all there and so you know that last shot of the day was absolutely the most important and most meaningful one um and again the ratio it was about 40 people around you know and then this one little family getting that vaccine but that felt exactly right 
right now we are in the part of trying to serve folks with so many barriers that are so complex and so intersecting um, that it might be, you know, 30 of us, you know, 30 people who are in, uh, you know, trying to do this wellness justice work around vaccine uptake to get one person that shot if they want it and if they need it. Um, and that's where we are. And that's the work that we're really excited about continuing to do as we pivot into the real world. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, this is a great public health graduate student um, who is uh, helping us out at our clinics. The other volunteer you'll see right there is um, uh, is a woman named Rika who is a Rotary president. So she's brought the Rotary folks into our effort, which means, boy, we've got those we've got things printed for miles. Um, may I have the next slide, please? Whoops, sorry, that was my last slide. I edited a lot of pictures. So. Um, Again, we always need volunteers. We have had the amazing opportunity to connect with Chelsea and her team and work with some of her graduate students. Um, our needs are going to get bigger and we welcome everyone to uh, join. I've made it as easy as possible for folks to, um, you know, join us for one clinic or for a hundred clinics. Um, and I would love if you reached out at Get Out the Shot. Um, to, to connect with us, our email is um, you know in that in that first slide, but it's gots.losangeles at gmail.com. I'm the only one answering it. Um, and so I would love to connect with you if you have ways or ideas about how we can partner together. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to be in this space with all of you who uh, are so expert in all of these areas. Tatiana, I think you are muted. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Anita. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so first of all, uh, before before I get started, I would just like to say thank you so much, um, Dami and, and everyone on your team for including us. Um, this has been such a profound um, experience to listen to all of the expertise that's coming, not just from uh, dealing with COVID, but for like the generations of work that's been done around public health, um, around underserved communities, and just the tenacity of um, all of the organizers that we've heard from today. It's, it's um, one of the most humbling and inspiring uh, things I've had the, the privilege of sitting in on. My name is Tatiana Brown, um, and I am the uh, community outreach lead for Vaccinate CA and Vaccinate the States. And um, and I'm Samitha Alonco, and I'm a volunteer with Vaccinate CA and Vaccinate the States. Yeah. Um, also, just for a moment, going to sing Samitha's praises. She says she's a volunteer, and that doesn't cover. I'm deeply excited to be working with her right now. She works on uh, phone banking, uh, volunteer coordination, and a whole bunch of communication work. So I just want to say it's. I feel super lucky to be working with this team. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, so Vaccinate the States uh, and Vaccinate TA started from a place of frustration and need based on the fragmented situation around finding vaccine appointments. Basically, a collection of folks realized that we were all, um, you know, making 15, 20, 30 calls to be able to, in order to like not get our parents or our loved ones vaccine appointments. And so what we did was we pulled our resources and came together as a uh, as a team of phone bankers that later include data scrapers um, and people reaching out to, to policymakers and other nonprofits to basically create the most comprehensive picture of the ground truth of the state of vaccination in the state of California. Um, so that meant that means for us that what we do is it, we put together um, uh, information that we get from a bunch of different uh, sources, including vaccines.gov, where um, we partner with them to, to see their information, as well as we have a team of um, volunteers who um, look at sources online and who call uh, different individual vaccination sites to find out how many vaccines and how many vaccine appointments folks have available. Um, we update our, our information uh, constantly. We have phone bankers who are working on a daily basis as well as data scrapers and web bankers. And we are um, we are 
partnered with a bunch of different organizations that have existing relationships of trust and platforms in order to disseminate the information that we get. We're interested in creating the most comprehensive picture of the ground truth of vaccination and making sure that it is easily accessible to everybody who needs it. Um, and so uh, part of that commitment to equitable access has been about making sure that, you know, from the beginning of vaccines being available for folks with limited, um, for, for higher risk folks, we were um, making sure that you didn't have to just be a person who could sit in front of a website and refresh it every single day in order to find yourself an appointment. Um, and that our, our, our focus has shifted slightly as the vaccine has become more available, but the main thing that we work on is making sure that it's easy for you to find out what, what vaccines are available near you and what kinds of vaccines. So um, with, with that mentioned, oh yeah, and just one other thing, like as an example of the partners that we're working with, in California, when you look for vaccination sites on Google Maps, um, they're pulling their information from our API, um, and that will be true for us across the country very shortly. I'm gonna pass, uh, I'm gonna hand things over to Samita right now uh, to show you how our site works. Could we go to the next slide, please? Thanks so much. And Tatiana did touch on this, but just to break it down on how we get our map, and I'll show you the map soon. Um, we have volunteer callers who basically have a queue of locations that could have potential vaccines, and we call them. And we have a script, and callers input information from the phone call into the database, and that gets uploaded onto the front end of the site map that viewers can see. And we compile this information often. And like Tatiana said, it's updated so often that um, we are able to put the update date stamp on the site. Um, and I'm going to show you that shortly. If we could go to the next slide, please. So our, like Tatiana said, our operations are going national. We started out with Vaccinate CA. So it was solely in California and our website was vaccinateca.com and um, then we grew it out to vaccinatethestates.com and I'm going to share my screen now so you can get a sense of what it looks like. So this is vaccinateca.com. I'm not trying to confuse you. The information you'll put in for California on the national site will work as well but all you do is um, type in your zip code and you will be able to click find vaccine and you'll find your vaccines on a map. Um, for instance, if I put in a zip code, we will get lots of pins on maps with vaccines reported available. And you'll also notice that we have several languages that this page can be translated into if you need that. If we go to our national site, and this is vaccinatethestates.com, you'll see that you can do, all the green pins on this map are vaccines reported available. That is overwhelming to see, but also exciting to see. Um, and once again, if you put your zip code, you'll be able to zoom in on exactly where you are looking for vaccines. And the nice thing about the national site is right now we have the capability to filter by vaccine type. If you are looking to, vaccinate someone who's under the age of 18, you want to click Pfizer and all of Pfizer options will come up. You'll also see on the left that if you hit more details, you'll be able to see, well, first without that, you can see if it's walk-in or appointment only, the type of vaccine, the appointment, the location for making an appointment, the hours, any notes, and the phone number. And you'll also notice that you know, if you want to look at multiple vaccines, Moderna, Pfizer, we filter that for you. Um, and this is especially useful with all the pop-up events. Let's say you go to a pop-up, you get a Moderna, and then two weeks roll around and you need your second dose and a pop-up event isn't existing, you can use this. We also get information about pop-up events, mobile vaccination units onto this map. And um, I will stop my share now and switch back to the slides if um, Enrique could pull those up. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, just to give you a quick breakdown of how we're interested in uh, of the different opportunities that we have available for working with folks. Um, we've done uh, quite a few informational meetings with organizers who are directly working with 
uh, their communities to facilitate vaccination, whether that's like getting people appointments or working mobile uh, vaccination units. Um, and we are more than excited. <laughs> we would just be so grateful to have the opportunity to share the information that we have in any way that would make your work easier. Um, so we have quite a bit of data and are more than happy to provide you with analysis or support. If there's anything that you're curious about regarding the information that we have amassed over this time um, and like the, the state of the ground truth in your community. Um, if there are other opportunities uh, for partnering with organizations, we would be thrilled to work with you. Please just let us know what you have in mind. Um, the ability to, I just also want to say, the ability to sort by vaccine type is actually something that came out of speaking with organizers um, who were struggling with figuring out how to get um, members of their community vaccinated because they couldn't figure out which sites had which vaccine types. Um, so we're doing our best to be responsive to what community organizers need the most. So please email us if you have any questions. Also, if you want to see how to use our site better, or if you want to see what kind of information we have that might be useful to you, please also email us. We would um, love to hear from you and love to have the opportunity to figure out how we can leverage the information that we've gathered and that and, we're maintaining. Enrique, could you go back one slide? If anyone wants us to, if anyone wants to add our map to your website, you can. These are the instructions, they're right here. It's as easy as embedding a YouTube video. Click that tiny, or go to that tiny URL and uh, you'll be able to embed the map onto any website. Yeah, we are actually currently in the middle of a, an initiative to get our map onto every county health department website in the country. Um, just to make sure that like everybody has access to the information that we're sharing as easily as possible. And um, yeah, just to be clear, we don't actually, we don't do the work of setting people up with their vaccine appointments because we are a small but mighty team of volunteers. Um, but we do do everything that we can to make the folks who are doing that work have as easy a time as possible locating the information that they need. So um, I think that covers everything. If you have any questions or thoughts, please feel free to email us at, at, at outreach at vaccinatingstates.com. Um, yeah, it is, it's once again, thank you all for all of your hard work. Um, I'm just deeply moved to get to hear about all the work that you've done and excited for the communities that you support. Fantastic, thank you so much to all of our panelists. We are going to move forward to our Q&A portion of the day of the afternoon. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to ask if we can go back as I'm reading the first question, the first answer to that question, if we can go back to our Vaccinate the States, Vaccinate CA website and type in that website 90011 and search and find that zip code so we can we can really get some eyes on South Los Angeles and what vaccine availability is looking like there. So as we're navigating that, I'm gonna go ahead and read some of the questions from the chat and from our discussion. One of our first questions from Matthew is, loving these equity resources at the end of this presentation, will there be a collective resource that has all the links of resources that pre presenting partners are sharing? Yes, yes, and yes. We will be following up with you all to share resources. I also just wanna plug in, this is why we're asking everyone to complete that survey so we can know more about the organizations that have joined us and really get a sense of who's doing what and where. And that way we can continue to share these resources, but also other resources, because we know we are moving toward COVID recovery and we need to continue to support the least, the lost out, the left behind. And that cannot stop with just vaccinations, right? So we have to do that work uh, when it comes to substance use. We need to continue to do this work when it comes to the mental health crises, continue to do this work when it comes to um, employing employing these populations that have been adversely and disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So please stay on the lookout for resources uh, coming from this presentation, but also please sign up and do that survey and share that survey so we can really have this database so we can continue to uh, work with each other and collaborate. So please, please do that for us. And are we, I'm hoping that we can also uh, share Enrique or Dami, if we can give Samita access back to the um, the screen share, so that we can just show nine zero zero one one that south uh, that zip code 
um, in, in, on their website as, as we're doing this Q&A session. I just want to multitask as much as possible and be efficient with our time. All right, Jarrell asks to Dr. Veal, how can a nonprofit apply for the grassroots grants? And Dr. Sure. Veal, if you can just address that for us, and I have a couple follow-up questions for you also, Dr. Veal. Sure, I can send it out with the grant application. It's very simple. And as long as you're aligning to one of the community organizations or faith-based organizations or your nonprofit and you align with an existing vaccinator, um, that's trying to reach people, and it doesn't necessarily have to be vaccines, but it's something related to COVID vaccines, you are eligible for the grant. So I can send uh, the documents through the organization here, and they can send it out with all the other information today. Or you can put your information directly to me in the chat, and I can send it directly to you right now. Dr. Veal, just as a follow-up, how my organizations who are on this call connect with the Department of Public Health and connect with clinics that have vac vaccine allotments to collaborate on vaccine events or host pop-up events? Can you just share a little bit more about the specifics that folks on this call might do? Sure. We have a, uh, for people who want to do a mobile vaccine clinic, there are a lot of different partners, not just um, through the Department of Public Health. So if you reach out to me and I left my information there, we can connect you to one of the partners. I know Kedron is one of the big partners, but there are others as well across all of Los Angeles County um, that we can engage you with. So if you connect to me, we have a team of people who specifically work with mobile vaccine um, clinics to connect each other. And I know there's a resource list that you have as well that can connect uh, individuals. And if, if there is a specific request for a mobile vaccine uh, site, we do have that uh, link that we can provide for the resources from this meeting as well. Thank you, Dr. Veal. Reverend Hassan, how much does it cost to have a faith community engagement consultant, say that 10 times, to speak or have someone else from the CoVPN Speakers Bureau speak about the nature of COVID-19 vaccinations, clinical trials, et cetera? How much does that cost? All of the services we provide are free of charge, and we would be happy to schedule events with whoever would like to include us uh, in their uh, organizational meetings or in webinars or in town halls. And we, we would be happy to provide both the clinical and faith perspective to uh, the work of fighting COVID-19. Thank you so much. I want to turn to Chris. How can folks learn more about the clinical trials that took place at Vine Street Clinic or get engaged with under, other clinical trials and other research efforts at the clinic? And Chris, is the bottom line that this site was enrolling actively Black and Latino populations from South Los Angeles who have health uh, comorbidities, et cetera? What is the bottom line and how can folks get involved? Yeah, I mean, you pretty much summed that up uh, perfectly. Um, we were the leading site for a, a number of weeks with enrolling people of color. Um, and so uh, people can uh, go to our website, the uh, UCLA CBAM website, the UCLA Vine Street Clinic to learn more about the clinical research studies that we're doing here. But if they're interested in finding out about other clinical trials, they can go to um, clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and any study that's actively enrolling should be listed on that site. Fantastic. And I do just want to highlight in the chat, this has just been an opportunity for others who are on the call as attendees to drop in different resources that are available. So Paul has a resource here on, Git, uh, on, on stopping the spread um, on GitHub, I believe. So thank you for that, Paul. Thank you for Jesus, who has um, also shared a link. So I just want to thank everyone. And if you all do know of other resources, you know, please be sure to drop those in the chat. We're happy to aggregate these resources. I want to go to our Q&A. And again, that Q&A is open. So feel free to drop your questions into that uh, Q&A link. And the next question is, I have, and we're, this question is from Aaron Joy Collins. I have seen some of the conversation videos and they are fantastic. There's another demographic that could really use this type of communication. Has anyone done something equivalent for conservative Caucasians or conservative Christians? I am based in Georgia and we need something like this, especially in rural areas. So I think Robin began to 
uh, place an answer into the chat, but I would love for Robin to discuss that a little bit more in detail. Hi, thank you so much for the opportunity and for the question. Um, obviously, we can't be all things to all people, and we have made great uh, resources for Black and Latinx folks. Um, there are many, many other communities, and so I'm really glad to have the chance to speak specifically to, to white conservatives who are in our surveys the least likely to want to be vaccinated, to say that they absolutely don't want a shot um, of the demographic groups that, that we've surveyed. Um, so I posted in there a resource that I'm aware of. I believe it comes through the Ad Council and of course CDC has some initiatives, but it's called Christians and COVID. Dot, you might be able to still see the question. I think it's dot gov dot com. Let me just make sure I copied it straight. So I would have dot com Christians and the vaccine dot com. Um, and there's a group of um, scholars of divinity and uh, pastors, ministers who help to answer questions. And it's actually a pretty diverse set, but um, I think particularly for uh, evangelical white folks, that, that may be a good resource. And there are more, I've heard of other things in development. You know, it's like we needed all these things two months ago, but it takes time to make them. So um, keep your eyes out. I, probably not from us. I think we've got our hands full with our populations, but there is a significant need and we won't end this until we all end it together. So um, absolutely affirm that question. Thank you. Thank you. And I do just want to highlight that we have Dr. Jesse Clark on the call as a panelist, and he is an MD. So if you do have a clinical question, we do have an MD and a physician here to answer that question for you. And again, he was one of the co-PIs of the Moderna vaccine clinical trial site at Vine Street Clinic. We have a question here in the chat from Paul. Given the recent announcement regarding vaccinating kids, I am curious what new strategies are being employed to educate and connect kids connect more kids with vaccines. And I do see that Liz has 12 plus strategies and we would love to hear a little bit more about those strategies, Liz. I, well, this gives me a chance to talk about my favorite thing, which is, um, you know, the, uh, the mobile uh, vaccine unit, which actually, when I call it the vaccine ice cream truck, it is actually, and in fact, a vaccine ice cream truck. Um, so we're working on a um, mobile, not a pop-up, clinic, but an actual mobile, um, you know, sort of movable feast that we can bring from site to site and starting to partner um, with some charter schools in highly impacted neighborhoods who um, are, are looking to bring, um, you know, to, to bring vaccine access right to their families and to their students. What we have also found um, at our events is that our 12, 13 and 14 year olds are bringing the rest of their families with them. So we're reversing that pyramid a little bit of trying to get, you know, in some situations trying to get, you know, mom, dad, uncles, cousins to be those sort of health choice leaders for the kids. We're reversing the pyramid and um, kids came with a guardian who refused. And then, you know, once we were done, we said, see if you can get mom to come back. And we had an enormous amount of success when we decided to sort of honor that role of um, uh, of kind of health and wellness in the family that the younger child has. So we've really been working with that. And again, all of the strategies will be bringing places to where kids are and where we can easily connect with um, families to be able to give that consent and where they feel safe, which right now uh, is schools and um, rec centers. So that's our plan for the summer that, you know, will be the vaccine taco truck com coming soon to a rec center, uh, child care center near you. Um, so it did actually start as a joke. Um, and it's a joke that we are trying to uh, fund and, and make uh, make real and make it feel inviting and engaging for kids, um, but really honor uh, how many of our, um, you know, sort of middle adolescents are leading uh, that conversation in their families and continuing to provide support uh, with our outreach and our canvassing that way. Also, we'll have real ice cream, so you can, we'll let you know where we are if you really are in the mood for a bomb pop. Would anyone else like to join in on that question about getting youth vaccinated? And this is Dr. Veal, and we are actually going to sports places like soccer fields and places of that nature where there are youth sports that in some cases they're continuing in other places, they've been totally disrupted. And some of those organizations do have emails and parents who are still engaged and hoping to restart or already in the midst of it. So that's something that we're doing specifically 
in the uh, disproportionately impacted areas where soccer and basketball are two of the high uh, intensity uh, engagement uh, opportunities. Um, yeah, we, we've been partnering with some boys and girls clubs because uh, we have some of those relationships uh, because uh, during the pandemic, we had actually partnered with Major League Baseball. And so we were doing like COVID resources, food boxes, and then introducing, you know, reintroducing a game of baseball into the urban community. So uh, through that, we had had relationships with Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA, different organizations like that. So we're using some of those same organizations and coming back through when it's time to uh, get younger people vaccinated as well. Hi, this is Jim Manja. I just want to say that we are, um, I think that we're, we've been vaccinating hundreds and hundreds of, of adolescents uh, over the last week and a half um, at the school-based vaccination site. So we have several school-based vaccination sites, partnerships with Compton Unified School District, Linwood Unified, and, El and Los Angeles Unified School Districts. And so we have large school vaccination sites, and we've been vaccinating a lot of the high school students on campus and other family and other parents are bringing uh, young young folks to be vaccinated as well. So I think the school-based sites are extremely effective. Thank you. And we'll return to our Q&A portion of the chat. Walter asks, any estimate of the percentage of people in the un in in the unvaccinated black and brown targeted group in Los Angeles County who are true, quote unquote, anti-vaxxers, are anti-vaccinators, in quote, uh, versus persons with low priority for receiving the vaccine. So how many people out there are actually, quote unquote, anti-vaxxers? Any thoughts to this question from our panelists? I don't know in Los, this is Tracy. I don't know in Los Angeles County, but there is an estimate, an estimate that varies between 25 to 30%. And that varies by region and by um, political party. So I'm not sure. This is Robin. I can give national numbers. So not specific to LA County, but our latest survey that was done at the end of April, where are we? No, early May um, showed that Latinx folks are the most of those who are unvaccinated, Latinx folks are three times as likely to say they want to get vaccinated as soon as possible compared with other de demographic groups. So there's a real opportunity there that's not about being against the vaccines, it's about needing access and needing to know, to have answers to questions about where to go, what's it gonna cost. 45% um, of people who haven't been vaccinated have concerns about the cost. I think that relates both to the cost of the vaccine and also the cost of taking a day off work and maybe more than one day if you have some um, need to recover after the vaccine as well. So I think there's there's a great opportunity and I think it's indicative of some of the barriers that are in place around language and all the things groups today are highlighting ways to work through. Um, it's really impressive everything that's going on in the county to make sure people who want to get vaccinated can get vaccinated because that's that's where we can move the bar um, now. Thank you. And as we close, our very own Tom Bellin asks, has there been thought about using videos of celebrities such as LeBron James or Dolly Parton receiving the vaccine to appeal to key subgroups? Well, Tom, if you have the hookup with LeBron James or Dolly Parton, come see us. <laughs> Uh, but this is actually an effort that we have as, as part of uh, the work that our team is doing at CBAM to uh, reach out to key quote unquote celebrities, influencers, et cetera. So if you all have the connections with these groups and you're on this call, please get in touch with us so that we can collaborate on these PSA efforts. Robin, do you, I know you're out here doing quite a bit of work. Um, do you have any, any thoughts on this question? I do not have LeBron James on speed dial. <laughs> Um, and I think there, there have been a lot of efforts with celebrities and there are several celebrities that have been helpful in amplifying our campaign. So whether they're in the campaign or helping to amplify messages, there are certainly opportunities for influencers of all sorts to, to use their reach and social media is the free way to do that and lend their voices. And um, unfortunately, back to the anti-vaxxing kind of community, there are a number of celebrities who are hesitant because they know that there are folks, they feel the backlash of taking, taking a stand on that. And so I think it's helpful to, for us to 
especially uplift those who are sticking out their their heads to um, be voices of support. Yeah, um, this is Desi again. Uh, with with some of our relationships, we were able to get you know some celebrities to come by Kedron and get uh, vaccinated. I know we had Jordan Sparks come by there. We had uh, comedian Finesse Mitchell. Uh, come by and and so just utilizing our relationships across the country uh, that is one of our uh, ways that we want to get more information and get more people uh, wanting to get the the vaccination uh, because of you know utilizing the celebrities and the influencers yeah I don't know how popular Marshawn Lynch may be uh, in Southern California but he has a wonderful video of a conversation he has with Dr. Fauci about uh, a lot of the concerns expressed in the African American community about vaccinations. And it's easy to find, um, but I would highly recommend it. All right. Well, we made it on time, everyone, and almost can end a few. I hope I can give you a minute back. Uh, if I could do a reaction, I would. Uh, so I'll just do this, you know, spirit finger reaction. I just want to thank all of the panelists. I want to thank all the organizers. I want to thank our research team. I want to thank Dami. I want to thank Enrique. And I want to thank the California Community Foundation for providing us the support to make today happen. But most of all, I want to thank all of you. We had over 110 people participating today. Woo, woo, woo. So that was super exciting. So thank you. Uh, be on the lookout. We are going to hold a couple other virtual summits, one that is working with providers and healthcare workers, and the last two, one in English and one in Spanish that is going to be that is going to be uh, targeted to the broader community and, and, and additionally essential workers. So please be on the lookout for that. The virtual resources that you heard uh, today and the slides and this presentation will be posted on the CHIPS website. And we will also be e uh, emailing you an evaluation. We're asking you to please fill that evaluation out. Again, I just want to plug in that survey that we have that we asked everyone uh, to complete. We really want to create this kind of repository of community-based organizations and community leaders and and really uh, use this as a as a network to you know uh, to to collaborate around public health efforts. Hopefully, there won't be another global pandemic in the next year. But in case there is, we'll have this database to get activated, right? And to activate folks in in uh, in South South Los Angeles. And and on a serious note, again, there is a crisis. And, and COVID, there were already existing crises in, in, in the community before COVID uh, and COVID has only magnified and intensified the crises that our communities are facing. So we really want to just share, collaborate and really work with each other um, as, we, as we move forward to uh, look toward recovery and also just continue to support, uh, again, the least, the lost, the left out, the left behind. So I just, I really wanna plug that. We will have a series of upcoming focus groups and we'll be sharing with you all who've attended today ways you can be involved in that. Uh, did we have a flyer about that focus group in our slide deck? All right, so we'll be, con uh, again, we're putting it in the chat that we'll be conducting a qualitative survey and focus group and we'll be reaching out to you all um, about that. And if you want to participate, we do have a, a Google form that you can sign up for and we will also be sharing sharing, uh, sharing more information about that upcoming forthcoming study with you all. And I think that is it. Again, I want to applaud all of the innovation that's happening here, all the work that uh, our panelists are doing and all of you in the community are doing around ending the epidemic, but we recognize our work is continuing onward even after COVID. So please, if you have not done so today, please could, uh, con con complete our survey to help us better understand the needs and capacities of our community partners so we can have this kind of treasure trove and, and have this uh, database. And thank you, and I hope you all have a great weekend. And just again, thank you so much for your participation today. And thank you for all the work that everyone is doing as it relates to being on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you.